everyone. Welcome back to Smart Pack's Ask the Vet video series with Dr. Lydia Gray, Staff Veterinarian and Medical Director, and myself, Smart Packer Sarah. We're here to answer the horse health questions that are submitted and voted on by viewers like you. So thank you guys for giving us some inspiration. Mm -hmm. We got some great questions Lots this month. Lots of questions this time. If you want to see what questions have already been answered, That's we now have a whole new playlist mm -hmm. uh, where each question is broken out individually so that you don't have to go through a video as a group of five questions. You can see that your one question on one topic has already been asked and answered, so you don't have to waste your time submitting that question. Super convenient. You can find that. It's going to pop up over Lydia's head. It probably did a while ago while I was just <laughs> chat, chat, chatting away. And you didn't even know it was there. I didn't. It's been I there felt the a little time. bit of a weight, but okay. yeah. A presence. Yeah. Sure. So uh, last episode, viewers who have watched uh, several months in a row, you may have noticed uh, I, had, I had a little incident. Uh, which ha people in the Smart Pack office have been having a real good time with. <laughs> and so I, uh, I may have held a fly mask upside down and invented uh, nose holes for mm -hmm. your horse to have uh, in uninterfered breathing with his fly mask. And so we got a comment from uh, Marta Osana. And Marta, I have to say thank you. She said, Sarah, I hope one day to be able to BS my way around things the way you were able to with the upside down fly mask. Thanks for making my day. You all are fabulous. <laughs> And I wanted to read that not to make myself feel better about the fact that I didn't know the fly mask was upside down, but to uh, give a chance to shout out. We get a lot of happy customer feedback and yeah. a lot of folks who say, Smart Pack, we love you. You guys are the best. And the truth is, you guys are the best. Aww. And if we're fabulous, it's only because we get to serve the most fabulous and uh, informed and curious riders out there. So thank you guys for watching and learning and laughing with us. Thank you. All right, our first question, without further ado, uh, this was the first question that was submitted at smartpack.com slash askthevetquestions. We now have a super easy place that you just send your question right in, and it goes right into Lydia's inbox, and she immediately <laughs> starts researching the answer. Exactly. It's not, it's not quite how it works. That would be all you did. We get a lot of really good questions. Uh, but you can submit your questions there. So our first asker who got their question voted to the top was Gabby. And Gabby's wondering, I love giving my horse special treats. You and me both, Gabby. <laughs> so I was wondering what kind of fruits and vegetables are safe to feed your horse. I'm very interested to hear this answer too. I was too. Um, so when I looked this up, I really couldn't find any fruit or vegetable that's off limits to horses. Ah. It's not like uh, dogs or cats where mm. you can think of a specific people food yeah. that like everyone knows, oh, don't feed this, and occasionally new one gets added. There were some places that said don't feed rhubarb leaves. I, oh. I can't imagine that's... Where do you even get rhubarb leaves? I have leaves? no idea. There were places that said maybe cruciferous vegetables as like broccoli and cauliflower and oh, kale and those are some of my Brussels sprouts. Maybe don't feed those because like in people, some horses can't tolerate them mm. and they get a little gassy. Mm. Yeah. Um, I feel like you looked at me when you said that. No, no, no. But th there's not really any people food. Now there are some toxic plants to horses. Sure. But weeds and, and those aside, you can pretty much feed your horse anything you want to. That said, don't feed a bucket of apples or a bucket of this. You know, in moderation, they are treats. Mm -hmm. And a treat, by definition, I'm pretty sure, is something that is fed as a special, a novelty, a one, two, you know. Yeah, so. use sparingly. Yeah. Fun fact, uh, a not so common treat that Newman gets that uh, loyal viewers would know. Prunes? Prunes, yes. He loves his prunes. Have you tried the individually wrapped ones I yet? can't find them <gasps> where I live. Oh, no. Yet. Okay. Yeah, so that's All on right. my list. Next up, we have a question from Emily, who emailed customercare at smartpack.com. And Emily has the distinction of having won two Smartpack gift cards last month by getting her questions voted into the top She's five. She's an honorary Ask the Vet video. I, I really feel like this is like <laughs> Hall of Fame status. And so Emily has another question this month, and it's a little bit of a long one. So those are your favorites uh, we'll when they have multiple I'll parts. Sit here. Okay. What is the difference between liniments and poultices? Mm. Is one stronger than the other? Are there different types of liniments and poultices? Is it required to use paper, plastic wrap, and bandages with liniments and poultices? Also, 
does climate or weather affect the effectiveness of liniments and poultices? Also, <laughs> thank you for changing the world four homes at a time. I didn't know that was coming. <laughs> Emily. And changing the world four homes at a time is our mission. Yeah. So thank you for noticing. Well, those are some serious liniment poultice questions. She really, I don't know that I can answer. <laughs> she really got in there after it, but then I feel like she was like, but also, Thank you guys for being great. Mm. And so she's trying to butter you up maybe, to maybe. jump in and answer all those questions. Poultice me up. So <laughs> when I think about liniments and poultices, and I think about them frequently, um, I think of liniments as like Ben gave her horses. So it's that icy, hot feeling. Mm. So it's a cool mm -hmm. flash and then heat. And then because there's heat involved, it, it increases, they increase circulation, mm -hmm. you wouldn't want to use a liniment on something that's acutely injured or mm -hmm. a traumatic or a fresh uh, wound or injury or lameness, unsoundness. The liniment's more for, I want to sort of jumpstart my horse's circulation mm -hmm. or after we're a particularly tough workout, you know, I maybe want to um, give him, make him feel better, refresh, invigorate, and I can use a, a body wash or a brace or even read the label, but rub full strength over a certain body part that I know is particularly sore or a little bit um, not inflamed, but maybe a little bit swollen or bruised or something. Mm -hmm. So I, I think of him as um, something to sort of pick you up and it's, it's stimulating. And if you smell any of them, they're quite stimulating, right? That's one word. <laughs> Poultices, on the other hand, are more for that acute injury. Mm -hmm. So if I come, like we had a horse at our barn last week that was fine on one day and the next day we came out and her leg was big and warm and swollen and um, we had the vet out and so the, the first 24 to 48 hours we're like, let's slap a poultice on it. You know, so we, we used a uh, 20 minutes of cold therapy mm -hmm. and then we put a poultice on and then we wrapped it. So I use poultices to sort of draw out heat and swelling, whether it's on a limb. They're great for feet, for hoofs, or like for packing a hoof if you have a, a bruise or an abscess. So they're more of a, a treatment of the acute. Okay. So liniments, more chronic sudden inju injuries, or just, just for, for soreness and stiffness, and poultice more sudden acute. Okay. Do you, what's your opinion, what's your stance on the paper, the plastic wrap, the bandages? Oh, well, if you have experience in using liniments and poultices under wraps, if you know how to set up a leg, if you understand when you want a cold, wet poultice versus a, a hot one or a dry one, by all means, we have plastic wrap, we can put a, a wet um, brown paper wrap on them. If not, this might be a topic for your, next time your vet comes out and say, mm -hmm. can you show me how to do to keep my poultice active and wet for 24 hours? And he'll say, all right, well, so he'll, he or she will say, let's, let's ice down or cool the leg, let's get it wet, let's apply a thin layer of poultice, then let's apply maybe a quarter inch all the way around. Then we've got a bucket with our brown paper, poultice paper soaking, we'll wrap that than a regular standing wrap. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the, the wet way. But great question for your vet to ask him when it's appropriate. Also, re and I've said I think this is my third time, to read the labels because some products are appropriate for wounds and open skins, many aren't. Mm -hmm. So don't use them inappropriately. Some liniments can't put under a wrap. They're just too, what was the word we used, stimulating. Um, other, other liniments are made to put under a wrap. Mm -hmm. So you have to read the label. And so that answers the part of the question, are oh, there different goodness. types of liniments and poultices? Oh. Yes, lots of different types. Yeah. Active ingredients matter. Yeah. Read the label. Ask mm -hmm. your vet if you're unsure what's right for your horse mm -hmm. and the method that you're using to apply it. Great question. Does climate or weather affect the effectiveness? Do we have any opinion or research on that? That I don't know. I mean, it seems like it. if you're in a humid area, things would seem to stay wet longer. Um, if you're in a hot area, then maybe a liniment's more appropriate to, you know, cool the horse off after a workout. So that I think is up to personal preference and just individual what you notice. All right. Question number three. 
submitted by B. Hun on YouTube, and they are wondering, what are some signs that your horse needs to retire? What type of lifestyle can you create for a, tire, a retired horse if you don't have grass pastures? Well, I think there's no magic number. I mean, would it be great if, ding, they get a number and then we know. We don't know. Some horses want to retire at, you know, 10 or 12, and then others are like, 42 and I'm still going and wins the show. So you have to let them tell you sometimes, and then, but then you have to listen. So if they tell you, you know what, I'm done, and it might be not as obvious as an unsoundness or a lameness, that also would be easy, but it, it might just be a, I don't have the drive to perform anymore, the, uh, the brilliance that I used to have is not coming through, and, and that might tell you it's not time to retire, but time to back off a level. So if you were showing open or you were showing FEI or you were whatever, height jumping, maybe you just step down a notch. Mm -hmm. um, but still compete because it's not that you're going to take a horse that was active in the barn and actively showing it and going places and getting worked on every day and ridden every day and the very next day put them out on 40 acres of pasture. That actually is a really bad idea for mm -hmm. so many reasons. Horses thrive on routine. I mean, mm -hmm. we know that. They, they like their schedule. I mean, you alter their schedule, havoc ensues. Um, so even when you do need to retire a horse, you want to step down gradually. And some horses, they are used to being in an active barn. They're used to being in that front stall. They're used to going places. They like that. They thrive on that. And if you put them out in a 40-acre pasture with a goat, they're like, nobody loves me, woe is me. Then, you know, they're, they're going to lose weight and just not do well. So you have to do what's right for that horse, and you have to do it gradually, and then let them tell you, A, when it's time, and B, if they like what you're doing. But there's no magic number. There's no magic facility. Every horse is different. Some like the 40-acre pasture, and some like, nope, I want to stay in the competition barn and be part of the action. Otherwise, I feel like you don't love me anymore. So. I think my 28-year-old, Cody, Perfect is doing example. a little bit of that step down. So he was my competition horse mm -hmm. for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he became a lesson and a therapeutic horse for a long, long time when he was no longer sound enough to compete but still had right. a lot of energy and yeah. wanted the attention yeah. that only yeah. being in a summer camp program surrounded Having by 10 job. kids they painting on oh, you. Oh, that sounds fabulous. He loved it. Yeah. And so now he's stepped, taking the step down even more. He's moved out here to Massachusetts and he's essentially the Walmart greeter of our barn <laughs> where he is in that front stall. Yep. He hollers at everybody who comes into the barn. Everybody, all the little lesson kids, mm -hmm. they love him. And mm -hmm. you know, so it's a, it's nice that he still yeah. has that keeping him active because mm -hmm. he wants to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. And that said, I'm sure you do this, you still keep up with his preventive care. So oh, yeah. he still gets his feet done. He still gets his teeth done. Oh, he, gets does he, ever? <laughs> he gets vaccinations and he has parasite control and you have to vet look at him at least once a year. So you still have to do all that. On some of those, maybe even more that mm -hmm. they're older because some systems aren't as efficient. So you have to keep up on the, the wellness care. That's exactly right. We got a lot of great questions about senior horse care that we've answered in previous months. So mm -hmm. you guys remember that video playlist from the beginning of the video. Check that out. Question number four. Lauren also asked on the Ask the Vet forum, and it turns out there's no word count on this thing because this is quite the long question. Goodness. So Lauren is wondering, my 10-year-old gelding loves to goof off with his buddies and is a bit on the accident-prone side, so he always seems to come in from the paddock with a new nick, bite, or scrape. Although I don't treat every little injury, which is wise, I have used everything from hey, where's that blue stuff, to vetricin spray, to furazone, to triple antibiotic cream on some of the bigger ones. Honestly, whatever I happen to have lying around the, most of the time. I understand that. Most of the time I'm concerned with keeping the wound moist so it can heal naturally without scarring and keep the bugs and dirt out. However, I never really know what I should be using or if it even helps. What is your favorite product or recommendation for how to treat these minor injuries? When is it appropriate to use antibiotic cream versus a spray? Are there any products I should avoid? Charlie and I thank you in advance. Charlie. Poor Charlie. This doesn't sound like a controversial topic, yet it is. Ooh. It is. Um, I like it. Oh, boy. So this is an area where horse owners, I mean, you've been in a lot of barns. There are as many products for mm. wound care as 
like stars in the sky. So what that means is that nothing really works great then, right? And everybody has their favorite, and I'm not going to diss anything. Ooh, you're it, not going to put on a shirt that says oh, I'm team? man. No? I might. Something might pop out of my mouth. I'm going to try really hard. Okay. Um, the, the biggest thing is uh, we don't want to interfere with the horse's own healing. And unfortunately, many of the products found in barns do just that. Mm. However, horse people, I think people people, like to do something. Mm -hmm. You know, you feel like you need to do something. I, I'm the laziest horse owner ever because I see a wound and I'm like, it's a long way from his heart and I carry on. Um, it, it, it really, you have to clean it. Because one of the sayings we have is, um, dilution is a solution to pollution. Oh, you vets, um, you poets. That's, um, and that just means clean it. Now, there's tons of things to clean wounds. Mm -hmm. You know what you really need to clean a wound? Oh, I bet it's water. It's water. I it. It's water. Um, you can use saline if you want. If you really want to feel it's like fancy you're- Fancy water. Fancy water. This is what I like. Uh, it's a betadine solution, so it's, it's iodine. If you mix this in water or saline to a dilution of weak tea, that's an excellent solution potion to clean out a wound. I will also say if you're a person who likes to feel like you're doing something, Betadine feels very medical. It stains. It does. It stains, and it, it looks a little bit. Terrible. Like it smells terrible. It looks a little bit like like a surgery table, and yeah. you feel like I'm really doing it. Yeah. So. But be careful and don't use it full strength. Um, and you only need to do, really do it once. Don't clean every day with this. Be be gentle because if you overdo it with this or like hydrogen peroxide, there's mm. one. I'll say don't use hydrogen peroxide. Well, not That's unless you want to get kicked in the head. Not good. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're going to kill cells. Wow, I did not know Yeah, that. and you don't want to kill cells. No. you Because there's a couple stages of wound healing, and, and um, inflammation is necessary. Inflammation is not a bad word. And then there's the debridement phase where dead things and, and bacteria and, and hair, all that needs to leave so it can have a clean surface to then uh, epithelialize. Well, granulate in from the bottom up or top down um, and then make skin and then mature and so vets who are in wound care that that discipline they're like okay cleaning it's fine if you want to use um, we have a couple hydrogels this is one by prime the Terrison makes one I think it's this one yeah hydrogels would be good for the first couple days three four five days because um, they're water-based and they allow the cells that, that do the cleanup work to move around in there. Mm. Is that awesome? But then stop, you don't need them. Let, let the wound heal on its own. Once it begins to um, cover skin, make new skin, then and some sort of emollient, some sort of ointment that keeps things moist, like she says, mm -hmm. is not a bad idea. But not all emollients, ointments are made, are created the same. Okay. You know, some actually slow down, delay healing, and that's not what you want. So the articles that I read and the talks that I've gone to, is I, go to a, I, I try to go to a wound care talk at every vet conference I attend. Not that there's new information. I love you. <laughs> not that there's new information, but that I, I need, because I'm even tempted. Like, ooh, pretty products. Well, right? I'm even tempted. Well, we get such a great discount. I know, it's worth I know. trying something. No, nope. water. And then, do you know what the number one ointment vets are still saying? Experts in wound, in wound care are saying to put on wounds that will help healing and not delay. Ooh. I, if I guessed, I would guess something for people. Yeah. It's Neosporin? Yeah! Yes! Ooh. <laughs> it's yes. a triple antibiotic is still the best thing. And one other saying, this doesn't rhyme as well, I don't think I can make it rhyme, but don't put anything on an open wound mm -hmm. that you wouldn't put in your eye. That doesn't rhyme. No. It's a little catchy. So, but, but the point is, don't go overboard with wound treatment. Don't get excited, everybody stay calm. Talk to your vet and he'll tell you, she'll tell you when it needs to be sewed and when it's just an abrasion, like not a full thickness you can handle it or it needs sutured or it's 
it needed suture two days ago, you blew it, you know. Work with your vet, they'll help you. The location of it, like some wounds that don't look like a big deal, but they're over a joint, those end up being yeah. a big deal. Yeah. And then other wounds, horses have a remarkable ability to heal, let them do it. Okay, I like it. All right. Charlie, I hope you like it too. <laughs> Question number five, submitted by Canner That Course on YouTube. What is the difference between wobblers, EPM, and Lyme? Who oh boy, our shortest question might be one Longest of our most answer. robust. No, because um, I, I understand where she's coming from. Unfortunately, she's probably got a horse with some sort of gait asymmetry mm. or neurologic. And, and it's like, kinda. is it neurologic or is it lame? Mm. That's a big question. There are actually talks at vet conferences that are full, and all, they're only titled is he neurologic or is he lame? And we're all like, we don't know. <laughs> so that's where you start. And there, after you do a complete physical exam. Is there exam, a game show? Do you guys do game Jeopardy? shows? Jeopardy? Yeah. I can't, I can't Is he neurologic that. or is he lame? Like, <laughs> yeah. I feel like there's like a real... Buzzers yeah. and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I, can't, I can't disclose that. But, so you, you do your, your physical exam and then you might do a neurological exam and I I think Dr. Canips was here and he sure did was. neurological exam. So that'd be a great video to watch because there's some specific tests that can indicate to the veterinarian is the the brain working properly and is the spinal cord and then all the little segments coming off it working. Are they is the information flowing back and forth unimpeded? Mm -hmm. And so once you have it narrowed down to the nervous system is fine, now it's a lameness. Or in the case of Lyme disease, it's an infection. Mm -hmm. So we should probably start after that. Some of these are infections and some aren't. So um, the first one I think she mentioned was wobblers. And you might be called that, it might be called uh, equine wobbler syndrome. But it's the, the veterinary name is cervical vertebral malformation, or CVM. Oh, we all don't say that. <laughs> and what it means is that the some vertebrae in the neck are malformed and it can happen at, with birth, or it can be, it can be um, genetic, or it can happen with an accident or injury. And because the vertebrae are not formed right, and they, they compress on mm. the spinal cord as it mm -hmm. goes through, so then the communication is impeded. And so wobbler horses, their name, they stagger, they look like they're drunk. Mm. Well, the word we might use is, the vest might use is ataxic. So if you hear your vet talking about ataxia, that means wobbling and staggering and acting drunk and not having sea legs, whatever. So that's something that sometimes can be fixed with management, nutrition, um, and, and some medication. Usually it has to go to surgery. Mm -hmm and they put in a, a basket, they called, and stabilize the vertebrae that are not shaped right and that are pinching that. So that's wobblers. Um, but helpful that it has a treatment option? It can have a treatment, yeah. The problem is the prognosis isn't super great mm. for full restoration to 100% of what the horse was before mm -hmm. began to show signs. So that's, you know, when you hear about a horse being wobblers, you're like, oh, that's yeah. because we can save the horse, but it probably can't save the career, mm -hmm. um, and then it wouldn't be safe. So that so that's that one, and then um, EPM. So EPM stands for equine protozoal myeloencephalitis. So equine's horse protozoal is the organism that does the infection, and then myeloencephalitis. So the itis means inflammation. Yep. And the myeloencephalo is where the heck is the inflammation, and it's the brain and spinal cord. Um, EPM has been around since the 90s. It's only an American thing, so you tend not to see it in Europe or European horses. Um, it can be treated. There's three medications now. There's Marquis, there's Rebalance, and uh, uh, Ponazaril, Protozil is the third one that are all FDA approved medications for it. It's tricky because depending on where the organism lands in the spinal cord from the brain to the tail, you can have all different signs. Mm. And so that's why a horse with EPM Could might be like acutely wobblers. down, yeah. might look like um, like a West Nile virus, mm -hmm. it might look like a wobblers, it might look like a lameness. I mean, you just, until you know that this is neurologic or lameness and then where the lesion is, 
it's tough. Um, the APM horses also, when you first begin to treat them, can get worse right mm. away rather than better, and that's a little scary. So um, I would say if your horse is displaying any signs of gait asymmetry is a really good word, or in coordination, mm -hmm. um, that's because the sooner with these neurological problems you contact your vet, the better it is because the when there's neurological damage, it does tend to be permanent. Uh, nerve tissue is not that great at regenerating and restoring and rebuilding like some other tissue in the body. And then, of course, Lyme disease, also an infection. That one's tricky. These are all tricky diseases because Lyme can look, there's a neurological mm -hmm. component. There's a, a lameness component. Like one of the main uh, signs we think of with Lyme is the shifting lameness. Mm -hmm. Like they have hot, swollen joints. I swear it was the left front, and then you come out the next day and it's the right front, and so it moves around. And it, people can get it too, so mm -hmm. it's just, it's really uncomfortable. But they can have signs, they can have eye inflammation and all sorts of things. And um, that's a, a bacteria, Borrelia burgdorferi, spread by the deer tick. And um, I found out today that not everyone knows what the name is from, Lyme, Connecticut. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, because it's, so the, the, um, not every place in the country, like if you look at a map, it's, there's a lot of it in New England. There's a lot of Lyme disease in uh, the upper Midwest. And then, like, the state of Washington. Yeah. So, I'm thinking it's, it's states that are near Canada. Hmm. That's what it, that's what it looks like, yeah, so. Yeah, a lot of tick-borne diseases in other areas. Yeah. Different ticks, different diseases. This is but the yeah. number one tick-borne disease, yeah, of people and animals, yeah. so. But I, I hope her horse doesn't have these, um, but it can be tricky to figure out. None of them have good tests, really, to figure out quickly and 100% with, with 100% confidence what they are. It takes, yeah. it can take a while to figure out any of these three. Yeah, I think she asked what the difference was, but in terms of what the similarities are, incredibly frustrating, scary if you're the horse owner. Mm -hmm. So we hope that that's not happening to your horse. Right. Alrighty, well that was all of the questions that we had this time. So thank you guys very much for submitting those questions and for voting on them. You can, can I submit say the questions are Ooh. getting tougher and tougher? You can, okay. because you're the one who has to answer them. They are <laughs> as easy to read as they have been since the beginning. So thank you guys for that. Uh, next month we're going to get questions with like 18 syllable words. Oh, <laughs> I'm just going to be sitting here like, oh, <laughs> not familiar with this one. <laughs> So you guys can submit those questions, so hopefully legibly, uh, for the November episode on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, the blog. You can email customercare at smartpack.com. You can use Twitter. You can use smartpack.com slash ask the vet questions. I think I got that right. <laughs> and so you can use all of those great places. You can comment right here on YouTube. Um, and you can submit those questions for the November video until September 28th. If you're using them out in the social media world, don't forget to use hashtag AskTheVetVideo so that we can track down all those questions. Otherwise, you are not asking Dr. Gray. You're just asking your Facebook friends, which <laughs> could be risky, uh, depending on what the question is. And then, of course, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you see when the voting happens, so that you can make sure that your question gets voted to the top. Voting happens on YouTube and Twitter and our blog, and you can vote as many times as you want, and you can recruit all your friends. If your question was answered in this or any previous video and you haven't gotten your SmartPack gift card, yes, that's right, you get a gift card if we answer your question, you can email customercare at smartback.com and we'll take care of that for you. Thanks, as always, for watching, for listening, for learning. Have a great ride.